Nice to see you all, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, this is a session, Conway Swall in Practice, Agile Teams and Microservices. So the year was 2013, and the day, 11th of March. And I remember that day very clearly. It uh, feels like it was yesterday to me. Um, because something happened, something that basically changed my mind and my life. <laughs> The company I was working as a software developer for suddenly went bankrupt, just like that. <laughs> yeah, and I wasn't employed, had no job. But this wasn't an issue. I found another one in a month, uh, so I kind of lived it. But uh, this event made me think uh, why some companies are failing and basically uh, not succeeding while others are skyrocketing in their success. They are so successful and we admire them. And this is the reason I decided to focus my career on helping organizations and their teams to work better together, to achieve their goals, to meet their um, desired results, and basically helping them not to go bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's the reason I'm here today talking to you. I really love sharing my experience and knowledge, and I hope it's going to be useful for you. Uh, so now I'm going to warn you, I'm going to present myself. So this is, the, I promise you, the most boring part of this presentation. <laughs> so if you have something more important to do, for example, check your email, your Facebook, do it right now. <laughs> Usually it won't take me more than 30 minutes. So I'll raise my hand once I'm finished. Promise you. So, my name is Bogoy Bogdanov, and I'm from Bulgaria. Uh, currently, I'm working for a company called EPAM Systems. It is a large service-oriented organization. There are offices all around the globe. Maybe some of you have heard about it. And during the past four years, I'm working as an Agile coach and Scrum Master. Until now, I've been uh, Scrum Mastering and coaching uh, about 10 more than 10 different Agile teams. I'm organizing different trainings about Scrum, about Kanban, about Lean, and everything that you can think of about Agile, I'm doing it. And also, uh, but I'm a trainer, and I'm doing presentations like this one very often. The most significant thing that happened to me this year is that I became a father of a beautiful baby girl. And <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so if you want to contact me, don't hesitate to do it. There is a LinkedIn profile, you can connect me, you can drop me an email, or you can check out my website, agilepool.com, where I'm also sharing my knowledge and experience there. So, finished, boring part over, <laughs> now you can focus again on me. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's talk about our world. Our world is constantly changing, and it is changing so fast. You can see that in the past decades, how much new technology, how much new tools are created, and we start using them, not to mention internet, uh, mobile phones, and everything that, that exists right now. Smart cities, smart homes, everything is smart right now, besides me. And, <laughs> and we are able to do so many stuff, so many things in a single day that weren't possible before. And we are always in a hurry. We always want to do more. We always want to do more, right? Am I right? Can you raise your hand if you agree? Yeah? So we are always stressed to do new things. I'll give you myself an example. When I wake up in the morning, I have a huge backlog with items to do, and I start prioritizing because I know I'm not able to do everything. And I start prioritizing what I'm going to do first, what I'm going to do second, what I'm going to do third, and then I start my day doing the stuff. And just before the day, the day is finished, I'm glad I'm going to home. And then my wife calls me <laughs> and asks something again to do, for example, bring Brett to home. And this, this happened yesterday, yes, last night actually, just about uh, to go home to the hotel after the dinner. She called me, and you can raise your hand. <laughs> and she uh, wanted me to bring her a Coke, so I had to 
reorganize again everything that I was doing so I can bring her home, a uh, cock. And let's go back to the uh, end of the day. And when you go home, at least it's happened to me, when I turn on the TV, I hear all those advertisements. For example, are you stressed? Take this pill. Do you have trouble sleeping? Again, take this pill. Or do you want to have more energy during the day? Take this pill again. So there are so many pills we can take in order to improve our uh, performance. So, <laughs> you can share that later. <laughs> yeah, great example though. <laughs> All right, so uh, talking about software and companies, it is kind of the same thing happening there. So there are always new technologies, new things that enable the companies to produce more software. There are new ways to improve the organizational structure in order to gain speed. So. It is kind of the same. <coughs> All software companies want speed. They want faster time to market because the software world has so many competitors and they're arising every day. They are competitors that don't exist today. And companies have to be prepared to overcome them. It is easy these days for five people to create a startup and in a couple of months to produce a product that is uh, blowing everything away, right? You've heard about those magical stories. So companies struggle. What kind of pills are they going to take in order to make them faster? Should they take, are everybody seeing the screen? Uh, should they take the software enhancements? We're going to talk about microservices today. We're going to talk about monoliths. Should they become agile because you know, Agile is promising so many great stuff, like, for example, being 400% more productive, at least Jeff Sutherland says so. And we are going to discuss those things today. So I mentioned already microservices and monolith. So how many of you uh, know what a monolith is? May I see your hands? Yes, some of you know. And microservices, how many of you know? Okay. Uh, I'm going to explain it really briefly and uh, as simple as I can. Um, so, this is me <laughs> and this is my baby girl. So, microservices and monoliths are different things of the, uh, are different ways to build software. So, monolith software architecture is the one that has all the code in one single code base. Everything, all functionalities are built in the same project and everything is interconnected with each other and all the features are in one. So me, I'm representing a human being, a grown one that's able to do everything a human being is able to do. For example, I'm able to run, I'm able to jump, I'm able to do, do this presentation today. And my daughter, well, she, represents a microservice, not a microservice architecture, single one, single microservice. So microservice architectures are such that all the code is separated in different chunks. Each chunk is self-dependent, self-developed and self-deployed and is capable of doing simple things. Sounds correct? Yeah. So my daughter here, she is able to do certain amount of things that are grown human can do. For example, she's able to eat, sleep, and poop. <laughs> and particularly the last one, she's really good at it. I guarantee you that. <laughs> All right, so uh, are there any questions about this slide? Do you want to discuss more about the differences? I'll take that as a no. So today I'm going to tell you three different stories from the real life about three different companies. And the common thing about the three companies is that all of them wanted to gain speed, all of them wanted to get faster and be more productive. So, first company. 
Let's take a look at the organizational structure. I'm pretty sure nobody sees that and you don't have to. I'm going to explain it. So this is a company that exists for a couple of years, about 10 years. And its organizational structure was separated in component teams. So there was a business analysis team, there was a UI UX team designing all the software uh, UI, <laughs> basically. Backend team, frontend team, testing team, support team, DB team. You've, maybe some of you have seen something like that before? Yeah? And all the communication between those teams looked like this. So everybody was communicating to everybody and, uh, in order to create the software. And the software they created <coughs> during those years was a big monolith. And all the code was in a single code base. And since it was developed by so many people, it became a mess. It became a spaghetti code. So a lot of uh, old school technologies were implemented into that system. A lot of legacy code that nobody dared to touch because if you touch one place, it's going to blow something in the far, far away of this system. And the good thing, at least it was a good thing, that company became acquired by another company. And the other company saw this mess and said, okay, we're going to fix that. And the way to do it, we are going to become an agile organization. We're going to change the way that organization works and we're going to rearrange that. So they hired a really great agile coach to help their organizational transformation. Ade was talking about transformations previous talk and most of you know what that means. They started forming different Agile teams. So out of those component teams, they started creating all those self-organized, self-managed Agile teams. And in one year, because this is not an easy approach, one year, one year and a half, they were doing perfect Agile. They were really, they have implemented the values and principles and it was really great to see that, how they work and how they collaborate. So you would expect that they are going to be more productive, they are going to release more frequent software, they're going to be so performance boosts. But there was a problem. And the problem was that those teams had still to work in the same code base, same monolith, same uh, old school code. And it, t it took sometimes four to five to six teams to synchronize their plannings, to synchronize their daily meetings, to synchronize everything they do in order to produce a single release. So you can think that the releases were hard and very slow. So this was the first company. And we're going to the second one. Second company also wanted to gain speed, also wanted to be more productive. And let's take a look at this organizational structure. I'm going to explain it again, don't bother to read it. So this company exists for decades. So that means it's pretty old organization and they had pretty old style of working together. They had component teams, but those teams were not allowed by the organization. There were so strict rules to talk to each other directly. They had to trans transfer from one team to another huge comprehensive documents about everything that's being done by the teams. So does it sound familiar? Have you seen something like that? Maybe one, one, two? Be brave. Yeah, yeah, there's one guy in the back. Great. So there was a business analysis team that was deciding on its own what is going to be built for a single month. It was documented in a big document and sent to the central development team. And the development team was doing that thing, the requirements for one month. Afterwards, they were finished. They couldn't deploy the system themselves because there were strict rules. There was a support team that was the only responsible and uh, allowed team to do deployments. But they weren't the one who developed the software. So many times they didn't know even how to deploy the software. So the development team had to uh, 
uh, help them, support them to do that. There was, a, again, testing team, DevOps team that was organizing the structure itself. And all those teams were communicating with documents. And as you can uh, imagine, it was very slow to produce something. So they decided they're going to do microservices. And new products they're building, they're going to do microservices because microservices are promising so many great things. You can scale your product so easy, you can develop everything in a, uh, independent from other things, so there is no spaghetti code. And basically it's a panacea that is going to make everything great. And in fact, they did it. They created the new products in microservice architecture style. And everything was really good, organized in small chunks, functionalities, stuff like that. And do you think they became faster? Probably. Yes? <coughs> so, what? Probably not. Probably not? Okay, other opinions? <coughs> yes? Okay. But they didn't. Because the development team was not allowed to do the uh, deployment. And all the requirements were done in, in a month. So even if a service is actually ready to be deployed, it's not deployed. It waits for all things to be done, and then everything is being deployed, and then you have one big chunk release. So what we are examining here is that the organization itself is not supporting the technology. So do those two stories have something in common? How do you think? Yes, no? Can you speak louder? They failed. They failed. Yeah, okay. Why they failed? They have silos? Okay. This is the second story you mean. Okay. Yeah? They kept the old mindset. The second company. The first one, opposite. The first one, the opposite. Yeah. They changed one from each other. Yeah. Didn't change the architecture, changed the mindset. The second one, the second one did the opposite. The opposite thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. So they should do maybe both of them in order to gain the success they want. Okay. So lead, you are leading us to the third story. <laughs> slower and slower. <laughs> Great. So yeah, there is a common thing in those two stories, otherwise I wouldn't put that sentence there. <laughs> so, and the common thing is something called the Conway's Wall. How many of you, raise your hand, have heard about Conway's Wall before? A few people. So I'll read it because I'm pretty sure you don't see it. I'll read it for you. Any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Basically, that means the way you set your organization, the way you set your teams to collaborate and communicate, this is the kind of uh, software structure you're going to get in the end. Do you agree with that? Yes, no? Pretty much? Have you seen that? Yes? Okay. Some, somebody have seen that before? Happening? Yeah. So the, the thing is that whenever you want to change the organization, you maybe need to change the software architecture and the other way around. So this is leading us to the third company. And the third company, they took the Conway Swall pretty seriously. When I say seriously, I mean when I went to their office for the first time, I saw the Conway Swall hanging on the big wall so everybody could see it when they entered the building. <laughs> And I was surprised, why? Why is that here? What, what? Yeah. And this is a new company. Uh, it is about three, four years now. And I asked, why is this here? And they say, well, the Conway Swall is really important to us. We want, every, uh, we want everybody to have it in mind whenever they want to do a change, whenever they want to do everything, to have it in mind. <coughs> and they decided to structure their organization in a small cross-functional agile teams, so flat organizational style. And they decided to do a microservice architecture. So they kind of aligned 
the way microservices are looking as an architecture and the way their organization is looking as an architecture. So you can think of every agile team as a microservice itself. And usually when I talk about agile teams, I get the question, how small is an agile team? What do you think? How, how small is an agile team? Three to nine, okay. Your experience, of course, nobody. Three to five people, okay. Other opinions? Well, have you heard about the two pizza team notion? Yeah, it, maybe it's coming from Amazon, I think. Yeah? So the basically, uh, for, for those who don't know the two pizza notion, uh, they say that the uh, agile team is big enough so you can feed it with uh, two pizzas. But this is uh, <laughs> too American definition for me. I don't like it. And I want to bring it uh, into more Balkanic style definition. <laughs> so I would like to think uh, Agile team is big about 65 chevapis. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. So, and of course, maybe six to eight liters of beer. Right? <laughs> So this is the Balkanic definition of how small Agile team is. <laughs> and <laughs> if somebody asks you, I would like you at least to mention my name because I made it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So going back <laughs> to our third example, third company. So basically their vision about the organization was this. Every single Agile, Agile team will be responsible for a single service. So at least there were, at least at first there were only five agile teams and they developed five different microservices. And uh, they agreed, the company policy was that, that each agile team is responsible for uh, everything related to that microservice and supporting it. So you build it, you own it policy was integrated into that company. The, yeah, you support it, of course. And uh, they, they were self-organized. They were deciding how to build the service, what language they are going to use. Nobody was telling them how to implement it. They were deciding self-independent uh, yeah, team, and they were producing independent services. And what do you think happened? Well, don't read that. <laughs> Well, what happened is that they accomplished, they accomplished to unleash the maximum capacity of their teams. So each team was able to go as fast as it could because those teams were working independently fully from each other. Yeah, not completely 100% independent. There were some dependencies, but they were at least minimum. So those teams were able to continuously improve themselves, continuously trying new things, learning from their failures. And yeah, basically that, that organization kind of did it. But, okay, but we're going to. <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, each agile team was able to do their own releases. So all microservices were deployed whenever they could be deployed. And there were teams that were deployed deploying each month. There were teams that were deploying each in the end of a sp end sprint, two week sprint usually. And there were teams who were able to deploy every day, a couple of times a day actually. And that's how they managed to do frequent deployment and so fast, rapid development. But during the time they started growing. So that company from five teams went to 30 teams. And from 30 teams, now there are about 50 teams. So they started to grow really, really rapidly. And the microservices they were building were also growing rapidly. And in the end, they had this kind of structure. A lot of microservices and each microservice communicating with others. And it was really, really hard to, to manage that. So there was a problem. And how did they solve that? Any ideas? Somebody brave? Maybe shared responsibility? Shared responsibility? Mm, no, they didn't do that. They didn't, they didn't do exactly this, 
but you're in the right direction. Okay, Some, somebody else? What could be done here? Group components, warmer, even more hot, actually, not warm, hot. Okay. What they did is to organize in business domains. So the whole software, consisting of so many microservices, was organized into sub business domains. And each microservice is uh, falling to certain business domains. And they even formed their teams in those business domains. So you might not see it well, but all the teams there existing in one business domain were pretty much communicating with each other frequently. So their services were communicating with each other frequently. And of course, there was communication across domains, but it is un unfrequent, not so frequent. And those teams were also communicating uh, less. And there was a problem again. What kind of problem could it be? The delivery was too fast. The delivery was too fast? Well, <laughs> well, well that was the desired effect. <laughs> uh, no, there were, no, other thing. Uh, I will point you back to the Conway's wall, saying that the way you organize your code is going to reflect the way your, your teams are going to communicate. So I kind of reverted it. Back to Silas. Back to Silas. Kind of Silas, but not the Silas that uh, you have a team uh, that is responsible. You have a cross-functional team. Yeah, that's true. That's the real issue that they faced. So because of the way they were working, each team was focused on the microservices they were working on, they lost the big picture. And I'll, I'll change the slide in a second. <laughs> so uh, I had a problem as an agile coach and scrum master having uh, people from my team, actually my teams, complaining, well, I wanted to contact a guy who knows really good uh, Spring Boot and he responded to me, well, I'm really busy right now and I can't help you with that right now, sorry. So basically, it uh, was a problem. Teams became <laughs> <laughs> isolated. So they became isolated. And sometimes they, don't, they didn't even know each other. So this is an uh, issue. Because many teams had similar problems, and they, everything had to uh, invent the wheel, right? Uh, and it, this was an issue. And actually, the real story is that there were three teams sitting in the same room, and they had no idea what other teams were doing. Well, this was a side effect from the, coming from the Conway's wall. So, again, how did they solve that? What do you think? Go. Share demos. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many teams are there? Okay, ten. Well, okay. A shared demos is something that they did, uh, but as I said, there are about fifty teams, so there are fifty demos every two weeks. So you can't attend all of them, if, even if you want to. So uh, this is a good approach. What could else be done? Switch team members. Th they didn't do that, but it is a very good approach. Yeah, I agree with that. Some more sharing sessions that maybe some people from other teams can join and mm -hmm. the knowledge flow. Yeah, they did something like that. I'll jump into Okay. Other things? Maybe from your experience, how would you solve that? Temporary cross team assessment of one team. What is that? One team member goes to another team, team for two weeks or for a month. Mm -hmm. Some knowledge about what they do actually. Okay. Uh, this is happening, especially with uh, teams with different in different domains. 
where they actually have some um, need to communicate more. Okay. So, and it works actually. It is very original way. They didn't do that, but I will go back and tell them to do that. <laughs> so I'm stealing from you. Please tell me how to solve that problem. We didn't solve it, actually. <laughs> Give me ideas. That's why I'm here on this conference, though. Feature, what is a feature approach? It's pretty much as I see it, they are a kind of even silos in the domain, so to mm -hmm. say. So this model is pretty much unique. Mm -hmm. so when you have a feature, usually the feature does impact a different part of the system. So if you take ownership of a feature as a team, as two teams, mm -hmm. then basically you have a kind of opportunity to learn other parts of the system, e even though you are not an expert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is kind of what the business domains were doing, the features you're talking about, they were kind of in the same business yeah. domain. Yeah. yeah. The problem is when you have two teams from different business domains, they don't care much about each other. So, and but so yeah. Uh-huh. You mean when it's uh, overlapping? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I st I told you they didn't solve it, but actually they solve it partially. What they did is to organize different communities of practices, communities of practice. Excuse me for my poor English. Uh, uh, how many of you know what community of practice is? How many of you know? Yes. <laughs> one, one guy, at least. <laughs> Raise your hand. So, I'll explain it. Community of practice is where you have a company and uh, there are different kinds of practices, for example, design, for example, backend uh, development, for example, GB development, whatever. And people from different teams are interested in that topic. They gather together to share uh, their knowledge to explore new technologies, new things, and basically talk about it. So it, it, looks, li it looks like a chapter in Spotify. Have you heard about chapters in Spotify? Or across teams, technology. Uh, they were organizing uh, different hackathons twice a year. Everybody in the organization uh, had uh, one week doing nothing related to the projects and backlogs and inventing uh, new things. So the, the rule of thumb was uh, to form teams the people don't know each other or they don't work pretty much with each other and they develop something new, they think of something and they start hacking around and after the uh, hackathon is over, there is a big demo and uh, they are making, ma making a competition out of it. So there are prizes for first place, second place, third place. And it is very interesting thing to, to observe. There are Scrum of Scrum meetings. Those are not called Scrum of Scrums, but most of you have heard about this term. Uh, we call them uh, Tribe Tech Sync. It's like a huge uh, daily stand-up where teams are saying what they did, uh, what they are going to do, are they having problems. Uh, there is an open space initiative. I believe uh, 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 the keynote speaker talked about open spaces. And uh, we, do, we do those, it's a very interesting uh, thing. And of course, there are various trainings and workshops organized by Agile coaches and Scrum Masters. So I see people going, and I'll go to the last slide, wrap up. So let's wrap up. Software companies and organizations are always going to seek new ways and find new ways in order to get more speed and faster time to market and in order to be more productive. And what I would like to, uh, Remember from this talk is that whenever you do uh, a change either in the organization or in your software architecture, please have in mind the Conway's wall, work with it, not against it. This is the, the message here. And yeah, do we have questions? This is my baby girl. <laughs> what are your questions? Thirty minutes. Okay. It is thirty okay. minutes. Yeah. So there is a representer from each team. Uh, one, two representatives. It is a, a free event, so everybody can join, of course. Uh, and yeah. So basically, each team has uh, about uh, thirty to one minute to say we are working on that project. We are developing this and this. We have problems in this, and if they have uh, problems that are. Across teams, uh, they're uh, standing out as impediments, so we solve them afterwards. How often do you take those meetings? 
we do them, well, we uh, iterated this approach. So first it was every week, two times a week, but it felt too much. So they, they decided to do it once a week. And then, and now we're doing it uh, once in two weeks. Yeah. So we're uh, kind of um, changing that approach. We are organizing m my mini open spaces as well that are uh, not a day <coughs> because open spaces are even that takes one to two days. We are organizing mini open spaces that are about uh, one hour. So we are experimenting and iterating. But now we're doing uh, once two weeks. Okay, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Five minutes for to ask me questions, guys. Come on. Otherwise, I'll be gone in Bulgaria. <laughs> you won't have the chance. Yeah, well, one more question. Two weeks. Yeah. Usually not. Usually each uh, team decides when to start their sprints and when to when to end them. But sometimes, yeah, you know, we work uh, in an agile environment. Sometimes it's needed to be done like like this. When you have to do shared functionality, you need to synchronize the work. So sometimes we do that. But usually it's not the case. Okay. Very good question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Nermina, what is your question about? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so I can repeat everything all over. When should I over? <laughs> really do retrospective. Really do? Yeah, this is my favorite. Every sprint, yes. Why? Why is this a question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very interesting. Do I really do I really do retrospectives? It's a very interesting question. You don't believe in retrospectives, I guess. Okay. Uh, maybe we can talk about it uh, afterwards. So, okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, to listening to me. I hope it was yesterday. So, uh, on a stanza, raise your hands. How many of you think this talk was useful for you? Hey, bravo. <laughs> and of course, our sponsors. I just had to put that here.